this is the um, August 26, 2020 special meeting of the Fairfield Conservation Commission uh, serving in our capacity as the Inland Wetlands and Watercourse Agency of the Town of Fairfield. I'm going to appoint um, Charlie um, Nelson North and Dabney Bowen to sit as uh, alt uh, to sit as full members for tonight's meeting. We are going to vary the agenda. We're going to start out first with um, the bond releases, which are uh, Roman numeral five A number four. Um, the staff recommends approval of all of these, uh, of, bo of both of these uh, bond releases by general consent. The first is IWP 2013-14-02, formerly Rice, now RG Builders LLC, 3 Hickory Lane, new house construction within a regulated area, request of Brian Robick for final release of a 3,000... for final release of a $3,000 bond, and B is IWP 2018-19-11, Beachside Estates, LLC, 641 Penfield Road, new house construction within a regulated area, request of William Kenny for final release of an $11,972 bond. Annette, I assume you reviewed these and you are in favor of releasing the bonds. Annette nods to not, uh, indicate the affirmative on that. Uh, are we all in favor of this? Yes. 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 Did we just hear from Felicia? Was that what that was? No. And did we hear from Dabney? No. Okay. But we have six and that's enough so we'll, we can move on to our next item. Those, those requests are approved. Now we're going to move to um, Roman numeral four, which is a, um, a no, we'll move actually to Roman numeral uh, three, the, the approval of minutes of July 1, 2020. Has everybody had a chance to review? Any comments or questions? No comments. Are we all in favor of the uh, minutes? Yes. yes. Yeah. All right. And then approval of the recording secretary's bill of July 1, 2020. Uh, all in favor? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now we're going to go to uh, Roman numeral four, which is a, a discussion of a pending legal action. We can, under the statute, go into a closed executive session, which I would recommend since we are discussing pending legal action. And do I have a motion that we go into? Uh, closed executive session. So moved. Second. We all in favor? Aye. Annette? Aye. Mr. Chairman, are you going to invite anybody into? And um, I'm going to ask that we um, invite our staff in and also that we invite the attendance of our attorney, um, Timothy Herbst, if he is available by phone. And um, all, all in favor with that of those? Is that everyone's approval? Yes. yes. Right. So we'll have Brian and Sarah and uh, Annette will all stay in and everyone else will have to leave the room. And we'll have to turn off the televisions on this. Okay, well this is the Conservation Commission and we are now back in, out of executive session, back in public session. And um, I am looking for a motion to approve the proposed stipulated uh, the proposed settlement by stipulating uh, that the applicant can, um, uh, who is the plaintiff in that motion, in that lawsuit, can um, uh, build the building in accordance with the revised plan that was submitted to us that we have uh, on file, and uh, uh, for the reason that uh, we find that the revised plan, as I call it. Uh, it was very, very similar to the 2010 plan that we approved, or the plan that we approved in 2010, and that the changes between the, two, the plan approved in 2010 and this slight revision are minor, and to the extent there's changes at all, they seem to reduce the intensity by 
of the redevelopment by eliminating some of the parking. Missing anything there? All right. Are the revised plans the May 7th? The plans May 7, 2020. It's as listed in the stipulated okay. line what, down agreement. I just want to say it in the motion. What is the revised? I don't have the document. Oh, who's got it? You, who's got the? Je yeah. Jen, Commissioner Huhoff. Oh, here, this guy. No, what's the? You got the revised plan? Then it's what does it say? Okay, the layout plan dated May 7, 2020. A site plan sheet dated May 7, 2020. Comparison plan dated May 7, 2020. These three plans are referred to as modified plans. Prepared by Huntington Company LLC for Fairfield Medical LLC. Okay, so those are the plans. Now does everybody know what we're voting on? Um, so all in favor of um, the entering into the stipulated settlement uh, aye. aye aye did we hear from felicia was that that felicia aye charlie you so it's unanimously approved all right so that takes care of this matter i will say i joined the commission for my second uh go round in 2010 and um I'm going to leave in 2020. So this has been here almost the entire time that I've been on the commission. So Okay, next is there no let me just see is there anybody here uh in connection with the um either of the fee waivers is anybody online with connection with that all right since no one is then we're gonna I think we should uh, again if we can go out of order we should uh, accommodate the folks that are here um, and go into the public hearing There was a motion to approve the proposed settlement stipulating that the applicant can build in accordance with the revised plans that were dated May 7th, prepared by Huntington Company. Um, for the reason that the revised plan is very similar to the approved 2010 plan and the changes are minor and reduce the intensity of the development by reducing the parking. And the, the plans were dated May 7th, 2020. 20 um, prepared by Huntington Company. That I know Jen read them from. A layout it was layout plan. and plan. and a site plan so did you follow all that felicia felicia she back on back off it's on i can turn it off if you want Okay, we're going to move on then to our next matter, which is, um, oh, is this? 
Oh, IWPA 2019-20-12. And uh, would you please read the call? Okay. The Conservation Commission acting as Inland Wetlands Agency of the Town of Fairfield, Connecticut will hold a public hearing today, Wednesday, August 26, via public TV, Fair TV, and call-in. IWPA 2019-20-12, Sacred Heart University, Inc., 3135 Eastern Turnpike, the Western camp Campus, Assessor's Map 22, Parcel 91. Construct a new hockey arena within a regulated area. Call in number to ask questions, make comments at the appropriate time on the state is 667-776-9044. At this hearing, all interested persons shall have the right to be heard and written communications received. All applications and proposals are available for public inspection at the Conservation Department office by appointment at the Honorable John J. Sullivan Independence Hall, located at 725 Old Post Road, Fairfield. All applications and proposals are available on the Conservation Department website. This is dated Friday, August 14th, 2020, and Friday, August 21st, 2020. Um, recognized by Fairfield Con Conservation Commission, Kevin Gumper, Chairman, Catherine O'Donnell, Secretary, and Betty Grable, Clerk. All right, Mr. Fitzpatrick, I think you're up. Felicia, do we hear you from you, or are you missing? Dabney, did we ever hear from Dabney? No. Nope. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, for the record, my name is Bill Fitzpatrick. I'm an attorney in Fairfield with the law firm of Fitzpatrick, Fray, and Bologna. We're at 1735 Post Road. I'm here this evening representing Sacred Heart University, purchaser of the former GE headquarters at 3135 East and Turnpike. I'd like to give the commission a quick overview of the site before referencing the specific application before the commission tonight. This property is purchased by GE in 1971 from, I believe, St. Vincent's Hospital, had intended to construct a hospital on the site. After the purchase, GE subsequently made a gift of approximately 30 acres of valuable open space, and known to me as the Cascades, to the town of Fairfield. Property that's left per the tax assessor encompasses 68.46 acres. It's located in the Design Research District, which includes as permitted uses, those uses permitted in the underlying zone, which in this case is the R3 zone. The R3 zone includes a university use as a permitted use by special exception approval, and the PNZ has approved the use of this site for university purposes. Property at present contains three primary buildings. First is an office building located to the east, closest to the entrance to the property. It's a three-story office building constructed in 1973, containing in round numbers 172,000 square feet with parking below. This building is essentially a square, surrounds a single atrium or courtyard. The second building is located immediately to the west of the single courtyard building, and that is a three-story office building as well, overstructured parking. This, that building includes two courtyards and contains approximately 292,000 square feet of office space and appurtenance uses. The university has recently constructed an addition to the second building in the courtyard area, which provides an entrance lobby and a connection to the east building as well. The third building is a three-story, 28-room hotel conference center located to the west of the two office buildings. There are 787 parking spaces on site, 118 on grade, and 669 structured spaces. The specific application before the commission tonight relates to the construction of a hockey arena directly to the north, utilizing the Merritt Parkway as north of the most easterly office building. I should note the university originally intended to construct a hockey arena and an auditorium directly to the north of the larger office building to the west. There were extensive discussions between the university representatives, conservation department staff, including an on-site visit, and eventually that plan was abandoned. The immediate plan involves a building of reduced size since the natatorium component has been eliminated. This application relates to the construction of a new hockey arena structure 
and service access drive around the structure, as well as the construction of stormwater detention and drainage facilities within a regulated area. The presentation to the Commission tonight will include Michael Rettenmeyer, a landscape architect with the SLAM Collaborative from Glastonbury. Testimony will follow from Tom Daly, a professional engineer with Malone and McBroom. And finally, the Commission will hear from William Kenny of William Kenny Associates. I will then conclude. I should note that this application will be followed, if all goes well, by a subsequent application to the Town Plan and Zoning Commission. The Town Plan and Zoning Commission has jurisdiction over zoning issues, including, among other things, building design, projected traffic, and parking. Um, university, the university representatives have revised their plan several times in response to the concerns of the Conservation Department staff. The end result is that the Conservation staff is recommending approval of this application with conditions. Um, the, application of, the applicant appreciates the recommendation for approval, has issues with three of the proposed conditions of approval. Uh, one is the question of the size of the detention basins. You'll hear from the experts on this issue. The second is the extent of the drainage easement. Uh, you'll hear some testimony on this as well. The third is the invasive species control uh, that the conservation staff is requesting as a condition of approval. I have, Mr. Chairman, a one-page synopsis addressing these issues. Um, is it proper at this time for me to submit? This is just a markup of the three paragraphs in question included in these. That will be very helpful, Mr. Fitzpatrick. It's a good idea. So to just take a look at these, Mr. Chairman, um, the point that the recommendation for approval makes is that the stormwater detention basins are oversized um, and should be scaled back. Uh, they are oversized. They're oversized for a reason. I think the testimony will support um, the present design. I'll just leave it at that for the moment. Uh, secondly, we wish to define the invasive species control plan I believe this has been discussed uh, with Mr. Kenny and the Conservation Department staff uh, that the, uh, the control plan wouldn't be limited to the removal of vines from trees and Japanese barberry. That's what I'm including, adding, proposing to add, and I'll let Mr. Kenny address that. Lastly is the uh, stormwater detention easement. We have no objection to the easement. I do have an objection to including the adjacent upland meadows and woodland areas uh, within the easement. To me, the easement should be over the basins themselves and the structures, not any drainage to those structures. I believe that has been discussed and more or less agreed upon with staff as well. I will not speak for them. Um, Mr. Chairman, again, I'd like to have the experts start at this point. Uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Michael Rettenmeyer, a landscape architect with the SLAM Collaborative from Glastonbury, Connecticut. Michael. Thank you. 
Yeah. I can move that lower one up after I talk to that. Thanks, Bill. Good evening. My name is Mike Rettenmeyer. I'm a landscape architect at SLAM. On um, behalf of the design team, I'd like to give you a little introduction about the building and the project itself and then hand it over to Tom Daly and um, Bill Kenny. Uh, this proposed building is a 120,000 square foot new ice arena focused on delivering a great fan, fan and player experience for Division I hockey. <coughs> SEG has shown great promise recently in their hockey program getting into the nation's top 20. Uh, for the first time in school history this past season. In also in 2019, the Pioneers won the inaugural Connecticut Ice Tournament, uh, which annually hosts Yale, UConn, and Quinnipiac, all top-tier programs. <laughs> SHU hopes to bring the program to campus, um, and we'll have the students and fans filling the 3,000-seat arena. The plans, uh, the rendering to the top here of the interior, uh, show about 2,500 seats in the, the bowl, which is where the majority of the people are in that image, uh, which you enter from the top row down. There's another 500 seats located at the upper suite area, which you can see up to the upper right in this image. Below the concourse, there's men's and women's team rooms, facilities for strength and conditioning, skate sharpening, cooking facilities, and of course, numerous locker areas for visiting teams and programs. Uh, the building is situated to the north of the east building, downslope protecting neighbors from view. Although once arriving on West Campus, visitors will be welcomed by the dyna dynamic building entrance where students will be dropped off on game day. The proximity to the existing buildings allows a direct connection to the existing indoor parking with 700 indoor parking spaces, as Bill mentioned is in his intro. Uh, would you guys like me to move this? Up top, or is it okay? Yeah, we'll hear. Yeah, I can. So we can be on the second one. Thank you. <clears throat> Regarding the proposed site design, uh, as you travel up the existing access road, which is in the lower left hand of the image on the screen. You'll first reach the new service road that crosses the existing uh, watercourse channel. Further up the hill is the new visitor and shuttle drop-off mentioned earlier and the entry plaza that welcomes visitors to the arena. The service area and drive, the entry plaza, and a small portion of the eastern part of the new arena are located within the 144-foot upland review area. <clears throat> There's also a small 36-space surface lot to the south, directly adjacent the access road, which you can see directly on the left side of this image. As mentioned earlier, visitors also have the option to utilize the existing parking garages within the east and west buildings. The service area includes a loading dock at the event level, which is the lowest level of the arena, as well as access along the north side of the building to the utility yard to the west, which is on the right side of this image on the screen. Uh, the entry plaza, uh, is formed to work with the existing topography, which is challenging in this location, and the existing water course channel. It's a short walk for spectators uh, once drop off as the, to get to the main entry. Along the way, you'll find a sculpture of Big Red, the school's mascot, a series of seating opportunities that uh, define the, uniques, or the plaza's unique shape, and a small plaza with decorative planters that hides the service area below. The existing water channel um, is at the front door to the arena, and we really wanted to take the opportunity to improve the existing conditions. SLAM will be working with Bill Kenny's office on finalizing the notes on the demolition plans and uh, the design adjacent the water course to create a naturalized buffer uh, with native plant material, as noted in staff comments. Uh, rain garden is also being located on the north side of the small parking lot. <coughs> um, that, excuse me, well, that will have native plantings uh, and we'll be collecting stormwater from this area. Um, with that, I'd like to pass it over to Tom Daly, who will talk more about the site uh, detention, drainage, and utilities. Thank you.
Good evening. For the record, Tom Daly with Milan and McBroom. Uh, we serve as the engineers on the project. I'm a professional engineer licensed in the state of Connecticut. And uh, uh, so starting from the beginning, this is a sheet uh, C100, it's the same sheet you have in your packet. But the water resources we're talking about this evening, um, so uh, to get orientate you, Bill, talked, Bill Fitzpatrick talked about the East Building. That's this building here. This is the proposed uh, skating rink or the hockey rink. And we have basically the parkway located here on a, running uh, north, uh, east to west. The resources we're talking about this evening are, there is a, and Bill will get into much more detail on this, but uh, we have um, stone line channels. They're man-made channels that are, are uh, through the project. They were built when the project was built. Uh, they're aligned because they're really traversing some fairly steep topography. So they're trapezoid in, in nature uh, with stones laid in it, and they tend to be more shoots going down through there. But they've served their time. They've done a very good job in terms of taking stormwater on top of the site, getting it down to the bottom of the site. Uh, so topography, we have high, we have a slope that goes all the way down through here, and then we have this kind of flat plateau as you've seen a million times probably driving along the highway with the helipad down at the bottom. So the regular activities we're talking about this evening are associated with, with these uh, channels. So I've highlighted these channels here. There's one that runs along the, uh, the eastern side, comes down. Here's the heliport. It actually meets up with another channel here. There's actually a cross culvert at the heliport, heliport and it, it goes off to, the, um, to off to the west. There's a similar uh, one that's also running down. Uh, Bill indicated, talked about the, uh, the other building and then the hotel. This runs down through here. Um, there, was a, there is a small uh, wetland seep here um, that was, Bill indicated we had an earlier plan. That was of concern there, but at this point we don't have any regular activities associated with that, that wetland air over there. Uh, the, the area that we're dealing with here currently actually doesn't drain directly to uh, the, um, these channels. It actually, until it gets way down to here, it really sheet flows all the way through here and just goes here. So we have some wooded area, some stone slope, and then it comes down into basically a meadow, uh, a lawn area there. Ultimately, there's some ponds uh, plan, plan left off site here, and those channels get to that. So really, we have three drainage systems we're going to uh, present to you this evening. First of all, the existing buildings have a drainage system that comes out just below the buildings and discharges into uh, the channel. Uh, where we're putting the building, that the, the building is being dropped basically on top of those. So our first drainage system is just to pick, drop a manhole, pick up that drainage system, and route it around the building. So we have this, and it goes right back to the channel as it does today. Our other drainage system of note is the driveway comes in here and we're crossing the channel. Mike spoke about it. We are proposing a six foot wide by a three foot high box culvert. It is designed to convey the 100 year storm out of the channel. So we did a full hydraulic analysis of the upper watershed and um, we designed that box culvert to, um, to convey that water. They'll have concrete head walls on both sides and then Mike and Bill Kenny have come up with planting, si planting plans on the upside and the downside of that uh, culvert. But ultimately, it'll be a you know, traditional precast concrete culvert. Um, that's the second drainage system. But all the drainage associated with this project will be directed to two uh, basins located here in the upper left-hand corner of the, pro uh, of, of the plan sheet. One thing that is unique about this project, um, if we were building a brand new hockey rink on a campus, we would be looking at hundreds and hundreds of parking spaces that we would have to deal with. But it's proximity to, as Bill indicated, there's all underground parking under here. So we're able to take care of um, uh, all that parking demand by existing resources that are under the building. Um, so really the primary, f there is a small parking area here. I think Mike indicated about 30 something spaces here. But that's pretty small, so all, they're going to utilize the existing parking, and that's really a, a large benefit. So in terms of impervious surface, we're really talking the building and a service access drive to the back. Uh, that's in, in this 31 uh, car parking lot. Uh, all that drainage is picked up and directed, so any proposed impervious surface, even though there was be an opportunity to get our, our water right into um, 
into the channel and sending us on our way. We're actually picking all that drainage up and sending it over to the, the stormwater basins. That's to provide water quality and to uh, meet the stormwater standards of the town. So ultimately, we pick up all our water. The first thing we do is we route it through a stormwater chamber. So that'll be designed for 80% removal of total suspended solids. So that'll polish that, that stormwater as soon as it comes off. I mean, our experience is roof water tends to be much cleaner than, than parking lot water. But we're still putting that stormwater system in place. And that's located right at the back of the service area. So that vac truck can easily access that, that water quality chamber and clean it out. And that's a lot easier than going down to the basin. Now. So that's one other reason we put it. Then we run drainage down into here. And we have basically, we've designed two basins, but they almost function as one. But the benefit of two basins is we're providing the DEP water quality standard, or the first flush, plus some stormwater management in this first basin. We run our basins. We tried, we worked hard to get long pathways so, so water doesn't short circuit through the basin. We'll come out one end and out the other one, come in this end and out the other end. So the water DEP's water quality is provided in the first basin, but both basins together work um, to provide a zero, zero net increase in runoff from the two to the 100 year storm. We also meet the town standards where they ask us to, to take the 10 year storm and ratchet it back so it doesn't exceed the peak of the two year storm event. What that results is not only that storm, but all the storm events actually see a fairly significant decrease in impervious coverage. Uh, sorry, in, in term, uh, in, in a significant decrease in peak runoff rates to the point where the 100 year flow out of here is almost half of what it is under existing conditions. So the way it's, this, this water would come through here, this basin, the other thing about having two basins is we're able to work with the topography. They're terraced down. So this basin bottom is about elevation 114, and this is down at 11. So instead of we're fighting the topography, we're able to terrace these basins down. And then also, we feel that sometimes when you get two basins in series, they're actually more efficient than just one big basin. But this basin's tucked more up into the topography, and then this basin is down into the flatter area. Uh, one thing I would note is these basins, as Bill indicated, are oversized. Um, working on the Jewish home site uh, and working with town staff, it was indicated that we should approach um, to plan for additional impervious down. This is not a development job where it's going to be built and nobody else will do anything. We know the university continues to evolve and continues to, um, to, to improve their facilities. So, when we designed this basin, we actually put in an additional 1.5 acres of impervious coverage to basically bank ourselves for later on. If it never gets used, then this basin is just going to be even more efficient over time in terms of water quality. And, um, and even the water quality volume was included in that, that 1.5. So if it never gets built, they're even more efficient. But we, we uh, found on the Jewish home to be, that, would gr that was great advice because they did come back with a plan later on, and in that basin didn't have to be modified. All the planting that Bill Kenny had proposed in there didn't have to get ripped up, didn't have to get changed. So we feel strongly that land banking that. The one thing I would note is this basin, even if we did reduce it, it's not resulting in any clearing of vegetation. It's located in an area where it is meadow or lawn. So, um, if we did reduce it, it ultimately, we believe it would reduce about, only about 9% of the regulated area that we're presenting to you this evening. So we feel strongly that it's good planning for us to oversize this basin. Um, we also, as part, of, um, as part of our plan on sheet 101, we did put together a, a detailed erosion control plan. Um, and what we tried to do is, is we never really uh, rely on one level of protection. We're always looking for two and three levels of protection. Um, down at the bottom of, of the construction site where the biggest amount of activity is going, we're actually putting a diversion swale to a temporary sediment trap with silt fence. And then on, behind that is um, straw wattles. So it's that three level of approach to allow for erosion control. And even along the entire edge of the swale, 
uh, we are proposing both silt fence and straw wattles in addition to these sediment traps. So um, because we do understand that there is some topography here, that initial earthwork phase is going to be important, let's get it. Once the building goes up, the, the potential for erosion really gets diminished uh, significantly. We also, based upon um, comments from town staff, uh, we did develop a phasing plan. And really, the phasing plan is focused on really stormwater management to a very high effect. So one of the things we want to do is get these stormwater basins in place. Uh, and so phase 1A is constructing those. And one thing that of note is the town has indicated uh, there, there potentially could be some concerns by the helipad is where our access drive is going through there. And there's some existing pipes. And we don't know, you know what the characteristics of those pipes are. So we're going to basically put a steel plate over those, no different than when you see highway work. So those pipes don't get crushed or damaged or, or something like that. We're going to put a steel plate over those pipes so the construction traffic doesn't have any negative impact. So we have phase 1A, which is basically all the stormwater basins. Also in 1A is this parking lot, the 31 car parking lot, because that's going to be the construction staging area. We need a place for the contractor to put uh, his equipment, job trailers, those type of things. So 1A, 1A. In addition to that, the next thing we want to do is put in this crossing. It's a critical point, right? We're going to cross over that, that channel. Um, so we want to do is get that all buttoned up, get the box covered in, and get that all settled in um, for that. In addition, once these three things are in place, then we can do is we're calling out for phase two would be the major earthwork of the project. So this would be all the earthwork of the project. Um, once those three things are in there, phase three would be some road work and some utility work along the existing driveway. And then also uh, the building would be phase three. At the end of the project, when the construction is done, phase four would basically convert this construction staging area and where the contractor job trailers are, they would take those out and they would finish that parking lot right there. So we're trying to do a logical approach through here, um, but really focusing on the, the critical stormwater elements in the early part of the phase. Um, so they're in place and then they can get, they're, um, they're already functioning while this project goes under construction. With that, Bill Kenny would be next to present. Good evening, I am Bill Kenny, the principal of William Kenny Associates here in Fairfield. I am a professional wetland scientist, soil scientist, and landscape architect. Uh, my firm was retained to assist with this project in a number of different ways. First, uh, we were asked to uh, investigate the property and identify and locate where the different wetlands and watercourses are on the property. Then we were to asked to assess the conditions of the wetlands and watercourses and other uh, natural resources on the property and work with the design team to find ways to minimize impacts to those wetlands and watercourses to the greatest extent possible. And then um, also assist with the design of some of the mitigation measures to ensure that at the end of the day, the project would result in a net increase in wetland area and wetland uh, function. And uh, that is, in, in summary, that's what our conclusion is, is that the project will have a net increase in wetland area uh, and a net increase in the function and value of wetlands on the property due to the proposed project. Uh, that's even with the short length of crossing um, of the man-made drainage channel. So uh, the wetlands, and we'll just step back. The property has been heavily disturbed over the last century, particularly in the 1970s. I don't, I'm not sure if there's a square foot on the property that hasn't been 
where the soil hasn't been disturbed and, and cleared of, of vegetation and so forth. If you look at the report that we submitted, it's a wetland and watercourse assessment report from uh, March of this year. We have a photo, aerial photo in there from the 1970s uh, that shows just after the GE buildings were constructed and there's not hardly any trees on the site um, and uh, some white pine that they had planted, but they really between um, gravel removal from the property, just like uh, the Lake Mohegan open space area and the creation of those ponds, that was from removing gravel uh, out of the, that area. And like I assume on here as well before GE, and then uh, with GE coming in here, they really reworked the whole property. And what was left is about uh, just a couple acres of wetland and watercourse areas. And they, in the uh, top left-hand corner here, or the western corner of the property are a couple of man-made ponds. It's inter uh, two ponds, series of two ponds, and they primarily were designed for stormwater management. Uh, and then to get the water to those ponds, they designed these channels that you've heard about, these stone-lined channels. And the stone in those channels is quite large. It's like two, three feet, often big flat slabs of stone. And they're uh, trapezoidal shaped channels with angled banks and a flat bottom. And the stone just lines the whole thing. And uh, it, was, it must have been quite a bit of an effort because there's quite a few linear feet of those channels. So one comes down the left-hand side, empties into the first pond, and the other comes down the uh, right-hand side here, or the eastern portion of the property and another here, and they make their way down. So the wetlands and watercourses are man-made features, and their primary function at the time was for drainage uh, conveyance and drainage detention. Uh, so that these channels, primary function, conveyance. And um, they do, at this point, meet the definition of an intermittent watercourse. And the ponds are, are a perennial watercourse. Uh, they, they have some, in, within the channels and in a few areas, in the bordering, a narrow fringe around the border of the pond, there are wetland soils that have formed in there, but it's, they're primarily watercourse areas. Um, the site is uh, mostly lawn and other ornamental plantings around the buildings. Uh, here, there's an old field area here where it's uh, trees that were white pines that were planted when the buildings were constructed and then other woody vegetation that has made its way into there. A lot of shrubby vegetation, vines, uh, and some early successional trees, very young trees. The lower area here, we have the helipad and the area that's relatively level. There's a, a lawn area here as well. And then along the very eastern portion of the property and western portion, you have young woodland areas as well as around the ponds. And uh, there's a small meadow, upland meadow area here. Uh, this area was disturbed a few years ago, but reseeded, and uh, there's a nice me meadow that's been uh, created there. So, uh, with the, as been discussed, the activities within the wetlands are limited to just the uh, crossing over the channel. It's in an area too where it's just downhill of where the channel begins, and these channels, like this channel here. The water comes from pipes that are collecting water from the buildings. So uh, from the buildings, parking lot, ornament, ornamental landscape. So a series of pipes come and discharge to this channel and, and provide the water for that channel. So uh, the crossing is, is just downstream of that area. Um, I forgot to mention that one other wetland area that we found here was a um, hillside seep. and that also is a man-made area. It's directly below a fill slope of the building, and I suspect there's drainage associated with the building that discharges there and has created that seat. The mitigation, although the um, To uh, complete the proposed crossing for the driveway, the primary function of that channel will be maintained. It, water will still be able to be conveyed through that channel. But even so, 
uh, there is a proposal for mitigation. And uh, what we're showing here, we developed a plan that is the, um, the title of our drawing is the Stormwater Basin Planting Plan. It's uh, sheet number SB100. It shows uh, this portion of the plan. The, the basins are just east of the existing ponds in the northwestern corner of the property. And as Tom has described, there's a series of two, series of two basins, and we've proposed a planting plan for this. It, uh, these basins are currently in it, are proposed in an area that's currently maintained as lawn. So we're going to convert that area that's lawn to be entirely a meadow area. Uh, so you'll have, but at the bottom of the basin, you'll have wetland meadows. And then on the sides of the, the berms in the basins and beyond that, it'll be upland meadows. So we'll have a series of wetland and upland meadows here. It'll be immediately adjacent to that existing meadow that I described earlier. So it'll be a, a, a nice complex, a nice area of meadow, and we're eliminating quite a bit of lawn to create that. Um, at the very southeastern portion, we, where the, the eastern pond abuts uh, the early successional woodland, we are proposing to plant trees on the uphill side of that berm to restore some woodland area there that is being disturbed to uh, create this. So uh, there's a significant amount of wetland area being created and with that meadow and the reduction in lawn area that we think that's, uh, we find that to be a good thing and certainly uh, su sufficient to offset uh, the crossing that is proposed. So you'll end up with an increase in wetland area and an increase in function with that. In, a, in addition, uh, uh, I, Annette had recommended some mitigation for controlling invasive um, plants, and we are in agreement with that with the uh, slight modification that uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick mentioned earlier. And um, I had discussed that with Brian and Annette, and I believe that was their understanding that that change was acceptable. And that was within 50 feet of any of the wetlands on the site. We would control uh, vines uh, primarily to ensure that the forest isn't being smothered and killed by the vines. So cut the vines, allow the trees to continue to grow healthy, and then also uh, remove Japanese barberry that might be in the understory in those areas. There was also, um, we did contact the Connecticut Deep uh, to have them review their files for any potential listed species that might be endangered or threatened or listed otherwise, a uh, special concern. And uh, this area has, in, within the state's files, they have record of an eastern box turtle population within this area. So we will be uh, in accordance with the request the proposed special condition that the staff has recommended. We will be implementing a box turtle protection plan during construction and then also after construction developing a, a management plan for the property. So that, uh, with that, I take any questions that you might have if there's any at this time. Chairman, in concluding, I just uh, note that this project has been the subject of a rigorous review by the conservation staff. Uh, we have reached an accommodation on virtually all issues with the essentially the exception, exception of the one issue, the size of the proposed detention basins. And the Commission heard particularly from Tom Daly of Malone and McBroom on this issue. The oversizing of the detention basins was not an oversight. It was done intentionally to avoid unnecessary disturbance for future projects. The coverage and floor area ratio percentages for this 68 acre site confirmed that there is additional coverage permitted on site of approximately 120,000 square feet and additional permitted floor area on site 
of approximately 225,000 square feet. Uh, the oversizing accommodates 1.5 acres of impervi additional impervious surface. That's in round numbers 65,000 square feet. That's about half of the additional coverage that's permitted. Uh, there are no additional projects planned at this point, but as was done on the main campus, it seems wise to plan for the future. It might be a feasible alternative to shrink the detention basin to just the capacity needed for this project, but I submit it's not a prudent alternative to avoid future disturbance of a planted, engineered detention basin on a site which can accommodate, at least on paper, significant future growth is, I think, good planning. This is particularly true when the majority of the additional land to be, to be utilized for the detention basin is already disturbed, it's lawn. Uh, to return to the application as a whole, the applicant agrees with the conservation staff conclusion that the proposed hockey arena location is the most feasible and prudent location and that the application is not expected to have significant adverse or unnecessary impacts on the wetlands, water courses, or regulated area on site. For these reasons, I'd request this application be approved. The experts and I, as well as Carmelo Cicero Santolin from Sacred Heart University, who's here tonight, we will be happy to answer any questions the commission may have. Annette, do you have any comments? I'm Annette Jacobson, for the record. I have a bachelor's degree from UConn in Natural Resources and a master's degree from the University of New Haven in Environmental Conservation. Okay. And um, I've been employed by the town since 1983, first as wetlands compliance officer and then as the conservation administrator since 1989. And I'm quite familiar with Fairfield's wetlands and water courses. And I'd like to submit my curriculum vitae for the record. So. And I wanted to um, let everyone know if anybody that's watching Fair TV, if they can't, or the, even the commission can't see the um, exhibits really clearly, we have them all on our website. You all had gotten your own copy of the uh, plans, but for the public, if they can't see any of the exhibits, they are all on our town uh, website. Go to fairfieldct.org, the Conservation Department, then to the Conservation Commission, files and documents, and then pending inland wetland applications. Choose a subcategory, and then it says inland wet IWPA, Sacred Heart University, West Campus Hockey Arena, and they can find all the plans. So I had prepared a staff recommendation dated July 9th. 2020 and tonight's um, my presentation will be a summary of this document as Bill Kenny said the wetlands and water courses on site are mostly along the fringes of the property when GE developed it the, they were man altered and most of the water courses were moved to the sides of the property and then the two ponds at the bottom um, of the property. So they, there is the wetland seep in the sort of center of the property, the hillside seep, but most of the water courses are along the fringes. In my report, I had indicated that I was concerned about the um, survey of the property, that it did not show all of the uh, wetland areas that did show all of the wetlands in the areas that they were proposing to disturb but 
the A2 survey showed the entire property, but it didn't show all the water courses on the whole property. But they have uh, submitted a, an updated A2 survey, and it does now show all of the wetlands and water courses. Bill Kenny's mapping always had showed all of the water courses. They just weren't on the survey. But that plan is has been submitted. It is part of the record. It is on the town website. The property does contain a Connecticut DEP DEEP listed state listed species of special concern, the eastern box turtle, and they inhabit old fields and deciduous forest and are often found near small streams and ponds. And this site has ponds and the small water courses. So this site um, has the areas that this um, species um, is known to inhabit. So the DEP has many recommendations to protect those species. Uh, the regulated activities, the proposal is to construct the new hockey arena with the service road crossing the open water course with the concrete box culvert, 28 foot crossing with a six foot wide span and a three foot rise with the retaining walls at each end. No new parking garage or large parking lot is proposed. It uses the parking for the east and west buildings and only the small drop off area with the small surface parking lot. The two new detention areas are proposed down slope and generally near the ponds. The first one they call a stormwater pond and the second one they call a stormwater meadow. And then the stormwater meadow overflows into a level lip spreader which seeps then into the existing pond. It, it absolutely will detain to our 10 to 2 standard and um, have a zero increase up to the 100 year storm. So it absolutely meets the standard we were looking for. The excess detention capacity that they've provided the 1.5 acres of extra impervious surface um, makes these, in my opinion, excessively oversized. Going on to the anticipated impact portion, the alternatives, the location, um, I think is the most feasible and prudent alternative. Avoiding locating the building by the helipad avoids the long length of stream and water course disturbance because it, it would have had a longer length of connection along the uh, water course there and um, would have most likely involved a second water course crossing in that area. Another location for the building would have been um, closer to the east and west buildings and would have involved losing that hillside seep wetland. So the location that they've come to at this point is the most feasible and prudent location, even though it does require a water course crossing. Every alternative on this site had to have a water course crossing. So the water course crossing is necessary. So then we look at, if you're gonna have a water course crossing, how do you minimize the impact of that water course crossing? So the least impact is a bridge, the most impact is a pipe with fill. So because this is a man-made, um, man-altered water course area that was stone or boulder lined, um, we didn't feel you had to go with a bridge and a pipe crossing with fill was still you know, it's a bigger crossing. So we felt going with the box culverts, the concrete box culverts was a good proposal and is reasonable, feasible and prudent for this area. So we're okay with that as well. The plans as they were submitted um, weren't as clear as we would have liked about the plantings 
next to the watercourse crossing. So we had asked for a condition that enhanced those uh, plantings in that watercourse crossing area. And Bill Kenny has indicated that as a condition, we can work that out. So we'd like to see, um, we can agree to work that out. But back on the detention, it, it's usually not the case that we have more than enough detention. Usually staff is asking for, give us more detention. Um, but wh when you get enough um, uh, extra detention, it's usually called free board. It's usually a little bit more detention, just a little bit excess you know, just to make sure you've covered just enough. Um, in this case, 1.5 acres of impervious surface is about a football field and a half of impervious surface. And that's way too much extra disturbance. You do not have any clue of what it's for. They're saying some future development. So you have nothing to compare it to. There, there are lines on a plan right now. They can be erased and redrawn and tightened up and made smaller from the small watercourse coming down the hill. They can be pulled away. DEP tells us that we should have a 50 foot buffer to that watercourse for the Eastern box turtle. And that's less than 50 feet of disturbance now. It also tells us that you should look for feasible and prudent alternatives. You should, you should know what the reason is. You should know what you're comparing that excess disturbance to. If in the future, Sacred Heart has another project or proposal that requires additional detention, that should get evaluated on its own merits with what is that alternative analysis? What is that impact analysis? You know, if you don't have, um, you don't have excess disturbance for no reason, no purpose, you have nothing to compare it to. Um, that is absolutely against everything that you do in an inland wetland permit decision and the decision criteria. You're not weighing it against anything. Um, There's, there's, there's really nothing in the record. The Jewish home for the elderly, the, that used to be a hillside with actual Jewish home for the elderly buildings on that site that were totally then demolished. The proposal came in for two dormitories. And for when the two dormitories came in, they were gonna rebuild the detention basin at the bottom of the hill. And there was already on the, planning for the very next year to build three additional dormitories adjacent to the two that was the active proposal. So they already knew the very next year, not at some future date, not some plan we don't know about, they already knew exactly where those three dorms were gonna be the very next year. And I said, don't do this detention basin twice. We know those three dorms are coming the very next year, make that detention basin sized for those three dorms now. Totally different situation. It was previously developed. The land where the was totally upland where the uh, dorms were going and the detention basin was already going to be disturbed. We, we all we knew all those factors. This is a different situation. This hasn't been a disturbed area at all. We can make the disturbance smaller. We, we don't know if a project will come in next year or 10 years or 20 years from now, and there's no way to evaluate it. Also, we don't know how well the detention will work. If these basins are so oversized, they're supposed to function at a wetland meadow, maybe the wetness will be spread out too far and won't function as a, a wet enough wetland meadow. So we should make it smaller for the wetness that we're gonna get coming in. So 
it's not just let's make them extra big. We have to make them work the right way because it's not just a little extra water they're not getting. It's 1.5 acres. So I really think this is a big deal. On to the phasing. Our standard for phasing was met by doing the basins first to have a place for the water to go. Um, one, and, and then they're gonna do the crossing and then they're gonna start the building. So we like the phasing that they've proposed. One thing I do wanna point out is that they submitted a new plan this evening that is not part of your package and not on your website. Um, I believe um, Mr. Daly submitted sheet C108 and that is not something that you have. Um, and so um, we should all get uh, a copy of that and um, it should be put on our website and everyone should be able to take a good look at that. Now we had anticipated with this new um, hearing style that the hearing was going to be continued anyway, but we need to take a look at that plan. Um, the long-term easements, there, we had some discussion with Bill Kenny and um, we, we need to have obviously long-term um, attention to the basins and the, um, the post-construction stormwater management and operational management plan of the area. And there was some discussion about um, the extent of all of them. We know that we have to have some control over the meadow areas and woodland areas because they have a different runoff uh, coefficient that contributes to the basin areas. So you can't, um, you have to uh, allow for that in some of these documents so that that is known. You can't just mow those areas to lawn. You, it has to be recognized. But I haven't had a chance to read the exact language that they have in here. I hadn't read the exact language about the invasive species, but I know that we we have a general consensus of agreement that we can work something out regarding the easements and the invasive species. I just, I haven't gotten to the exact language. Um, that's substantially a summary of the staff recommendation. I'd be happy to go into greater detail. I would like to remind the commission um, that we did anticipate the hearing would be continued. I believe the next meeting of the commission is set for September 9th. Um, and that because the hearing will be left open, if you wanted to take, um, go out in the field to look at the property, um, you would have time to do that. Um, and if you'd like to ask me any questions or have any other information, I'd be happy to address that. Thank you. Mr. Fitzpatrick, you are your engineer. How, mu how much bigger is the detention basin? Not the area that it'll take care of, but the basin itself than is required. Uh, for the record, Tom Daly with Milo and McBroom. Um, based upon Annette's comments, we look back and to take the 1.5 acres out, we would, re we would reduce the basin about 21 percent. Correct. Well, how, tell me in square feet, how big is it now? Four, well, and, and on, on a land area, that's about 4,000 square feet on a plan, plan view. So 21 percent of volume would be required. You, you need to understand is with the Fairfield's standard. No, no you're missing, you're missing. Sorry. How much area is covered by your proposed? Total? Yes. I'd have to calculate that while Bill's, I'd have to. And, and one other and thing. And then calculate how much would be, how much area would be required. Sure, for what's maybe as Bill required. answers some things, I'll do a calculation for you right now. Um, one thing on the phasing, um, I can't explain, but the phasing plan is in your package. 
it's labeled as sheet 107. Um, I, I can't explain why the, uh, the sheet number changed on, on this set, but the phasing plan that I see on the back table is exactly the same phasing plan that I presented to you this evening. I don't know why the sheet changed, but we'll provide that with Annette on the record, but it's the same one in your packet. With that, Bill, I'll do some calculations and come back. And Mr. Fitzpatrick, wh when did you submit the, the, the easement to the commission or to the staff? The which, Mr. Chairman? Uh, and, uh, uh, apparently, Ms. Jacobson's not had an opportunity to review the language of the easement. No, I brought that tonight, Mr. Chairman. Oh. Mr. Chairman, I don't have much else to add other than um, I noted that there's significant or different additional coverage permitted on site, significant additional flurry permitted on site. Excuse me. I'm in a position where I'm just trying to plan for the future. This, there's no advantage to the university to spend more money on building a bigger detention basin, except that we know something is coming down the pike sooner or later. There's additional construction permitted on the site. We thought it would make good sense to accommodate additional detention on the site, particularly when zoning permits it on a coverage and floor area basis, and particularly since the area is essentially, the additional area utilized by the detention basin is essentially lawn. It's already disturbed. At this point, I'll let Mr. Daly come on back with that figure. I'll take advantage of this break in time <laughs> to uh, just briefly with regard to the detention basin and its larger footprint, I think is what we're getting at at this point by increasing the volume, how much more of a footprint. As Bill was saying that it's primarily a lawn area and with the, we'll be converting that to meadow. And that actually is an improvement in habitat in many ways, but in, in addition with the box turtle and so forth. So we're taking an area that's lawn and converting it to meadow and um, although the volume will be there, it's not going to be used. So it's just ground that's going to be reshaped and instead of being a flat lawn, it's going to be reshaped. It's going to have some flat areas and it's going to have meadow. And so um, it's not causing a disturbance to a wetland or a water course. I, I think it's, a, it's a, from a ecology perspective, it's, it's uh, if anything, it's an improvement to that area. It's a tempor very temporary disturbance. Let me follow up there. In your experience, um, with the water flow that's going to come into this increased basin. Bigger footprint, right. Bigger footprint be, have some kind of an adverse effect because on the basin itself because it's, it's not going to be wet enough? So we are proposing, uh, that's a good consideration. We're at the, ba the bottom of the basin, we're proposing a wetland habitat, pond habitat. Uh, it's been sized for a certain volume of water. And in, in my experience, there will be uh, plenty of water to support those, those habitat features at the bottom of the basin. For, for the record, Tom Daly with Milo and McBroom. Um, first of all, I would uh, admit that we have, d based upon receiving Annette's comments, we did not do a full hydraulic analysis to do that, but we did do a check to see what it would look like. Uh, the chair asked, what, what is the footprint of these two basins combined? It's about 49,000 square feet. 
so a little more over an acre um, for the, the footprint, and that was taken um, to, to basically the green area you see on I've highlighted. There's some a small amount of uh, grading beyond that, and we estimate that um, if we took out 1.5 acres, the volume of the basins could be reduced by 21 percent. And I will admit to you, you would say, well, why are you not getting a bigger bang for the buck? And, it, and one of the challenges is with the Fairfield standard to take the 10-year storm to the two-year storm, it's, that's a very um, strong element that we have to develop into the plan. So once you get that, um, that design parameter set, you don't, it's easier to add some more impervious surface. But we did initial calculation, and I, like I said, I would have to do, um, we'd have to do more detailed analysis. But we estimated about anywhere from, you know, four to 6,000 square feet of footprint would be reduced by taking the 1.5 acres out. So it's 21% of volume, but the footprint, because a lot of this is associated by grading. Um, it's just not all about volume. But that, um, that's, early initial uh, calculations if it's a if it's a condition this commission approves or or goes with then we'd have to do a full detailed analysis um, because if you saw in our packet we have a f pretty detailed hydraulic analysis thank you How, do we have any input from anybody in the public that you are aware of no and had so I don't I don't know if there's people willing to submit written comments or anything like that that was one of the reasons we discussed leaving the hearing open just to September 9th close the hearing and make a vote that night um, that's up to the Commission obviously um, but given the technical challenges we've had uh, and just trying to get this off the ground we didn't want to preclude anyone from at least providing some comment if they have them rather than saying that uh, they haven't had the uh, chance to put something in the record but as of now no no one has come forward or there hasn't been a great deal of interest over the phone or even from a meeting point standpoint um, from any opposition mr. Fitzpatrick in ordinary circumstances I would close the hearing now but I, I think mr. Carey's makes a good point um, we're in kind of uncharted territory here and I think it would be hoove everyone to hold it open and give everyone a chance to hear because probably the last thing in the world you want is a approval that someone then has actually at least colorable right to appeal from so uh, shall I'm looking to ask the Commission right now the pre members are we on board with continuing the hearing yes Yes. So, so we are going to continue this hearing until Understood, our next Mr. meeting, Chairman. September 9th. Are there any questions from the commission right now that any of my experts, because they may not be able to attend next time. Anybody? They're pretty thorough. Good job. Um, so, so just to make note, though, so that's only two weeks from today to keep it open, and then we'll close it and. And I Commission appreciate can vote. that fact. Um, Mr. Chairman, would it be necessary for me to have the experts attend that? I, I, I think under the circumstances, no, because I think what we're looking for probably is some input from members of the public, which would go through the, uh, probably through the office. And I'm sure staff will, will alert you if there's any issues that do come up and then you can bring the uh, staff or the people you need accordingly correct I mean that's I assume that's how it would work yes yeah, so again, I, we're I, in uncharted territory but I, I think that I it would work. you know from again we are <laughs> I, I've asked anyone and there hasn't been anyone but our guidance has been to put it in writing and we'll put it in the record um, and also I mean we, we were set up to take calls today but there's no one on the phone so um, from that perspective I think you know 
I don't think anyone has an interest, but I just don't want to. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, we'll close the hearing for tonight, but we are continuing it until September 9th. Sarah, are you okay to continue for a few matters here? All right, we, we do have a couple of matters here. Uh, new applications. Um, first is IWPA 2020-21, Wisniewski, 1019 Mill Hill Terrace, Assessor's Map 243, Parcel 63, demolish existing house and construct duplex within a regulated area. Um, Staff recommends tabling pending legal notice and departmental review. We all on board with that? Yes. Okay. Um, next, we have um, emergency IWPA 2020-2102, uh, Peter Ambrose, uh, ES Esquire, 180 Hillbrook Lane, Assessor's Map 148, Parcel 62, construct replacement driveway bridge crossing within a regulated area, and um, the staff recommends tabling pending legal notice and departmental review. He already built the, the driveway, did he not? Or that yeah, that with the, the bridge the there? The okay. We all on board with um, their staff recommendation? Yes. And then. I live on Carroll Road, which is part of the College Park subdivision, but I not, I don't, I'm not a member of the, <laughs> the part of the association that owns the um, open space, so I, <laughs> I think I'm okay to vote on this. Um, let's say, and this is a request for fee waiver on a future certificate of wetlands conformance, request of Galen and Megan Robbins, 127 College Park Drive to reduce the fee for removing an old asphalt driveway partly on 127 College Park Drive, which is Assessor's Map 145, Parcel 62L, and partly on a budding College Park Section 3 Association property, which is Assessor's Map 145, Parcel 62M, which would have required payment of twice the fee because there's two properties. The applicant proposes um, a payment of one fee of $1,020, and the staff recommends approval as this is an enhancement to the environment and it does seem to make sense to me. Um, Charlie, you all set on that? Nelson? Yes. Kathy, and yes. I will go along with that as well. So And then, um, let's see, number three, this is a, an old familiar one. Request for a fee waiver on existing IWP 2019-20-01, Maplewood Senior Living, 805 and 917 Mill Hill Terrace, Assessor's Map 243, Parcel 60 and 67 for proposed trails and fountain and pond, et cetera. Partial fee waiver was denied on, uh, unanimously on November 7, 2018. And now they're asking for a new, fav new fee waiver from uh, Mark, Mark Weinberger of Maplewood. 
Any comments on that, Mr. Carey? So there's a letter in the f there's a letter that's attached to your agenda that basically spells out their request. So they did pay the upfront application fees. What they're asking for is a reduction in the Schedule A fees um, based on the amount of wetlands that are on the property. So the fees to install the trails and uh, put the fountain in are something like eleven thousand dollars when you calculate the Schedule A cost. They they laid it out in their letter pretty well. So, and it seems to me we have gone all we we have no real set rule on this, but we have in the past um, been reluctant to waive fees. But we also realize that sometimes the fees just don't make any sense because due to the particular nature of the property, there's just a lot of wetlands for a small disturbance. Um, what comes to mind is I think the Country Club of Fairfield. We've done it a couple of times. We've waive things for them um, and somebody else we've done it uh, some other the cemetery we've done it for and somebody else we've done that's it for correct it when it doesn't really make much sense when you have a very large parcel I'm talking multiple multiple acres and there's a lot of wetlands on it the, the, the fee is calculated against all of the wetlands on the property so it can get exorbitant um, and I don't think our fee schedule was really designed to go that route um, but that's where it is, and we're probably going to be amending that again soon. Can you, uh, <laughs> can you tell me what, did, what? How much of a waiver did they want the last time? That they? How much money did they want us to give back or waive the last time, as opposed to how much they want us to give back now? Uh, I, I think they wanted it reduced to two thousand dollars. They ended up paying the application fee. Um, but but this is uh, I actually gave you my agenda yeah it's right yeah so yeah, it, in the minutes it said 10,750. They wanted to reduce to 1,180. But also in their request, they've included the $5,000 bond, which a bond they get totally returned to them. That's not a fee. A bond is a performance bond that's returned if they do all the work correctly. So that's not a fee at all. We're still holding a pretty sizable bond on the other project where they're still trying to establish the meadow that was a requirement as part of the development um, permit. So they're asking us to waive $12,775 in fees? So the, the fountain is being put in because they want to get rid of the, they want to aerate the water and has nothing to do with the requirements that we've placed on this. No. The permit has its own set of requirements. They're just looking for a reduction in the fees. They're, the fountain was their idea. Well, you have to do much. I know we've been through this before. No. You're going to have to do this much is, on this. It just is. No. It's pretty much covered by the work that was done the first time. When Correct. The, they probably won't go forward with the project if the fee's not waived because the fee is probably equal to the amount of the project. 
That's what I remember them saying, yeah. Or, or so I was told. My thought on this is that we probably, the disturbance fee is probably way out of line for this. And uh, it, it, there's a lot of wetlands on the property. I mean, it's just yeah. for not way out of line, but it's it's um, it's not making much sense. Um, if it was based on building a building, then yes. But the fountain, yeah. the the fee does not meet the level of disturbance based on what they're doing. I mean, a couple ground trails and a fountain is not much. I thought we approved the fountain once before. I can remember we're getting into. A lot of discussion on it. So we did approve the fountain. They're asking, they're, so they paid the application fee. What they're going, they're saying they don't want to pay the Schedule A fee, which is they need to pay that before they're getting. Well, did the they pay permit. it for the building itself? Yes. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what, that's kind of what I thought. So. Yeah. Oh, um, their fee for the building was high. Yeah. What is the twenty-eight ninety fee? That's twenty eight nine twenty eight ninety is a standard fee on every IWPA when, when, once it's approved. It's called permit fee. It's um, standard condition number four in all IWPAs. So they're asking us to re reduce this twenty eight thousand five twenty five by twelve thousand seven hundred seventy five dollars. So they almost half. Paid, uh, they already paid the ten thousand. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at their letter dated June thirtieth, twenty twenty, they have already paid the application of fee of ten thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. They are asking for um, the fees of one hundred and thirty-five dollars to be removed. That's actually a permit requirement. The one hundred and thirty-five uh, goes to the town clerk. We have no control over that fee. Yeah. So the fee of 2890 is a fee that's associated with the issuance of the permit plus the $9,750 fee, which is calculated based off the wetlands area on the property. The $5,000 is the performance bond that would be, have to be posted for the project. So I do think it would be um, uh, reasonable for the commission to waive the fee, uh, the permit fee, and the Schedule A fee. Um, they still paid ten thousand seven hundred and fifty, plus posting of the bond, plus they have to pay the fee to the to, to post the the permit on the RAN records. The entire project to install a a water fountain as they're requesting and to do the trails is probably in the realm of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. And the permit application fee was for this application? Yeah, so they already paid like 10750 Okay. They came in first and asked us to waive that. Yeah. And we said no, and they still submitted the application. Okay. Well, I wouldn't waive that fee then. The permit, I would, I mean, the the permit application fee. They, that, we already have that. That, was, have that. that that needs yeah. to be paid at the time of the application. Yeah. And they can't. We can't waive the hundred thirty-five dollars. No. And did they pay their sixty dollars to the state of Connecticut? Yes. Okay. Um, but the others, the Schedule A fee, I think, is entirely too much, and we can't waive the bond because it, they have to have a bond. And that's part of the permit conditions. Right. And the other fee, the twenty-eight ninety. Yeah. You could waive that. That's I would the think we probably they probably paid enough fees for this with the ten thousand dollars. Correct. Yes. Twelve thousand six hundred and forty. I think that's reasonable. I make a motion that we reduce um, that the, the fees should be reduced by twelve thousand six hundred and forty dollars. 
Aye. When the fees cost more than the project, yeah. there's a problem. No. Te technically, there's another public hearing on um, the plant factory, the Fairfield Medical. It's, it's tech. You then open it and close it, or they technically they didn't withdraw it. It's, they didn't withdraw it. It's still it, here. That is right. So it's, we can just can, we can they, just not open it and continue it until I get a letter withdrawing it. We can just keep it on the agenda until I get a letter to withdraw the application. It's nearly out of time, um, but it's... Uh... It's on the main agenda. Kathy, you want to call that? Uh, um, um, that, that call was read like in February or March. Please, would you just call it up? Okay. Yeah, just just read down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's on page four of the agenda under public hearings. It's uh, continued from March fourth, twenty twenty. IWPA two thousand nineteen dash twenty dash eleven Fairfield Medical LLC forty one eighty five Black Rock Turnpike Assessor's Map one eighteen. Parcel 41, construct a new residential structure structure within a regulated area. Is there anybody here in connection with this matter? All right, we'll, we'll close the hearing on it then. Thank okay. you. Make a motion to close. Second. Second. But, well, subject to reopening it for some reason, they say they missed it for some silly reason. But we'll close it for tonight. Okay. All right. All, up, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anything else? No. Yes. Motion to adjourn? So move. <laughs>